Good. Okay. Okay, it's a, that, that, is, that is wrong. I think there's a bit flipped there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Ten, ten minutes, uh, okay, it's 10 minutes further. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, welcome to uh, this really fast course. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here at Technion again. I think this is my first, fourth, third time in Israel. The first time I, could, I wasn't able to come, even though Ronnie invited me at that time. That was right after I finished my PhD, but it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, and this is going to be a very fast-paced course, I think. I hope you're ready for it. Uh, but feel free to uh, interrupt and ask questions. If we can make it, uh, if we can make it more participative, that'd be, that'd be great. So clearly, we're going to talk about memory systems. Uh, and I, I titled the course, Fundamentals, Recent Research, Challenges, and Opportunities. So there, there's a lot we're going to cover. And there's a static schedule that you have in your, I hear some echo. There's a static schedule that you have. Uh, is it OK? Is it OK for everyone? OK. I hear this echo, so that's OK. I'll keep going. <laughs> There's a static schedule that you have in the syllabus. Uh, I think static schedules are always there to be broken by dynamic schedules. So we're going to <laughs> we're going to betray that schedule, static schedule, quite a bit, I think, because of the runtime events and whatever we think is important to cover. Uh, but it's going to be fun, hopefully. So hopefully, uh, please participate. Uh, the first lecture, I'm, I, I'm going to go over memory importance and trends. Uh, but before that, I, I guess I'll briefly introduce myself. Uh, I'm a professor at ETH Zurich right now uh, for a few years. Uh, uh, I'm also at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, I still have a research group there that's reducing in size. In fact, one of my PhD students just got married in Antalya. That's where I'm coming from. And I figured out the flight from Antalya to here uh, to Tel Aviv is much shorter than the uh, drive from Tel Aviv to Haifa. <laughs> so it's, <laughs> it's easier to get to Turkey, I think, <laughs> than to travel between is within Israel. Uh, I, anyway, I got, I got my PhD from UT Austin, worked with the LPAT, and uh, worked at quite a few places, Intel, AMD, uh, and Google, VMware, and started the computer architecture group at Microsoft Research after my PhD, from where I moved to Carnegie Mellon. This is uh, how you can reach me. This is the best way. You can also use my ETH or CMU addresses, uh, but Gmail is the, maybe the easiest. And my website, and I'm interested in a lot of things in computer architecture, hardware security, bioinformatics, uh, a lot of things in computing platforms. And we're going to talk a lot about memory and storage systems. But I think we're going to uh, do, uh, have a lot of focus on these other things as well. I still hear this, but is it, is it bothering people? Yeah. yeah, I think so. It's bothering me also. Maybe it's too loud. That could be one reason. If we can reduce the, uh, if, if there's a way to control the, there's no volume, OK. What if I what if I put it down here? Much better, right? Yeah, I think it's much. Put it back here. Okay. How about here? Better? I think it's better, right? Huh? Just turn. Now? Okay. How is it now? Is it the same? I don't I don't see this here. This fluffy. <laughs> Two minutes to debug it? Okay. <laughs> Is it better now? Worse? I feel it's an issue with, usually this is an issue with the volume of the thing. If we can reduce the volume, uh, that takes away a lot of it. I can turn it off, but then the recording will have problems. Is this better? How about right? No, I think. I think. Yeah, device. I cannot put it on the belt. There is no. Yeah, unfortunately, I'll I'll try. How about this? I don't think it's an issue with that though. Yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> no, not on me. <laughs> no, it's, it's even worse. <laughs> Maybe, that I don't know of. If I carry it like this, is better? Okay, I'll carry it like this then. <laughs> it's not very convenient, but... Yeah, there's... Yeah, I think it's, it's not really still... Back pocket, okay. I'll try that. <laughs> we'll go through all combinations. Is it better? You think so? Okay. Okay, for one minute. I think, yeah, this, this, is, this is one of the location-dependent faults maybe, right? Which we're going to talk about. <laughs> you have this location dependence in terms of the fault occurrence. And, and fault tolerance is something that we're going to talk a lot about. By the way, is the uh, lighting okay? Okay. If this is going to get annoying, I think please tell me. I think it's a bit annoying for me, but hopefully we'll fix it later. Okay, these are some things that uh, my research group is currently working on. We're gonna cover some of these things. As I said, com com all of computer architecture is interesting to me, hardware, software interface, bioinformatics, and security. We're going to cover a lot of this in this course, memory, storage, DUM, flash, emerging technologies, and hopefully interconnect as well, since it's going to be a 26 hour uh, set of lectures. Uh, we're going to talk about heterogeneous and parallel systems. We work a lot on GPUs, systems for data analytics in general, and system architecture interaction. We're going to look a lot into that in this course, I think. New execution models, we're going to examine processing near or inside memory, and new interfaces that are required to support uh, things like that. And we're today at a very interesting interaction, uh, intersection of hardware security, energy efficiency, fault tolerance, and performance. We want all of them at the same time except these are all pushing each other in different ways. And hopefully we're going to cover that really exciting inter intersection. Uh, and I'm going to actually start with something that's very dear to me, genome sequence analysis and assembly art algorithms and architectures. That's an area of resource that's growing in my group. And it's one of the examples of ac applications that are really driving the requirements up and up, especially from the memory uh, and storage system. And I also have a significant interest in biologically in inspired systems and system design for biomedicine. And I think these things go hand in hand, actually. They can enable each other. Okay, so we're gonna cover a lot of things in this course. So these are four key directions. These are not the only things that we're going to cover, but I'm going to structure at least the first few uh, lectures uh, based on these key directions. Security, reliability, safety, energy efficiency, or memory-centric architectures, low latency. I think these are all important, uh, and we're gonna motivate them in different ways and architectures for genomics, medicine, and health. I'll start with this last one uh, as a motivating detour, uh, but hopefully this will kind of set the stage of an example application that has significant, that has huge requirements in from, from memory in many dimensions. Is it still okay? Are people tolerating it? Yeah. Okay. Sort of, okay. I don't know how to fix it, but. Definitely related to something here. <laughs> okay, okay, so uh, let me give you the story. Basically, this is really interesting to me because uh, this was our dream maybe about 11 years ago with one of my collaborators, John Alcon, who's at Bill Kent University now. While we were hiking Mount Rainier uh, in, in beautiful Seattle area, uh, we were discussing like what can we do that's something big in bioinformatics. And this was what we wanted to do basically, an embedded device uh, that could perform genome analysis in real time. Basically, you could give this device to anyone, let's say a doctor, and the doctor uses this to analyze someone's genome and within a minute comes up with a drug that actually is personalized for that person and their condition and whatever that's important. Or do analyses like this, which of these DNAs does the seg DNA segment match with for whatever reason that you're doing it, good or bad. Any technology can be used for good or bad, but we need to enable technology first. Uh, what is the likely genetic disposition of this patient to this drug, and many, many other things, right? At that time, uh, we didn't even have an embedded device that could do genome sequence analysis, but we actually believed in technology. Today, we actually have a device. I'm gonna show you pictures of this. We didn't invent it, other people invented it, but we need to actually develop the mechanisms to enable that device uh, as well. So we were very interested in basically uh, first doing the first step in genome analysis. And many of you have had some biology class, uh, I assume. Genome consists of four bases, A, C, G, T, as you can see over here. And these things are real. Every one of us ha has it. This actually, this is an interesting story. This is Henrietta Lacks' uh, genome, which was 
captured, she was a patient, and it was uh, gotten from her without her permission. It's very difficult to do it probably today uh, because of privacy reasons. But this enabled a lot of studies in genome analysis. So what is the goal in DNA sequencing? What was the fundamental problem that we wanted to target to begin with? Basically, we wanted to find the, we want to find the complete sequence of these bases or base pairs, A, C, G, Ts in the DNA. The key challenge is if you had a device that could do this, that could basically take long DNA as input and give the complete sequence as output, no problem, right? Then the challenge is solved. But unfortunately, no such device exists. And it's very difficult to build this device because it's really a matter of trade-offs. So all sequencing machines that exist today chop DNA into small pieces, but they don't, and, and they give you those small pieces, but they don't give you how these pieces fit together. So it's really a puzzle that you need to solve. You need to actually assemble uh, or match it to some other reference uh, to actually figure out where these pieces fit together. And that makes this a computational problem, and that makes this also a memory problem. So basically, you have this 3.2 billion bases, base pairs, and some machines give you pieces of length 100, 300 base pairs, and you have many, many of these pieces, and you need to figure out how these pieces actually connect. So I, uh, uh, I liken this to untangling yarn balls. You actually have these yarn balls, maybe different DNAs, uh, and you ch uh, the machine goes through it and ch cuts it into pieces with different technologies, and in the end, you have pieces of these different yarn balls, and you need to put together each yarn ball somehow. And that's essentially what happens when you actually sample some uh, DNA, because sometimes there are many, many DNAs inside that sample. Maybe I should move my hand. <laughs> okay, and these are the choppers, basically, uh, that, uh, that uh, do the chopping today. There are many of these machines. Uh, this is one of the most advanced ones, uh, maybe $3 million or so, uh, the last time I looked at it. It's very accurate in terms of its chopping. Basically, it gets error rates of 1% or so, uh, but the length of the pieces that it uh, chops into is about 300 base pairs. This one didn't exist when we had our dream, but we believed in technology. This is the nanopore technology. Now you can actually have it in your hand. It's about $1,000, $2,000. It has high error rates, about 15 to 20% uh, error rates in terms of the correctness uh, of the ACTGs. But the length of the thing is, length of the, thing, uh, length of the fragment it chops the DNA into is about, let's say, 800,000 or so. So there's a trade-off, as you can see. And usually, uh, Somebody asks, oh, why can't we build a machine uh, that can actually break that trade-off, meaning that can chop very long with very low error rate? If you actually invent that, I think you'll be very rich. That's actually a very good <laughs> research challenge. But I think it's very, very difficult also. And uh, clearly, this uh, G G Human Geno Genome Project drove a lot of this, uh, and it, it actually cost a lot of money, as you can see, probably more than what's written over here. Uh, but it enabled a lot of discovery also, and this enabled uh, uh, the um, construction of a human reference genome. Not all of it is complete. Even that is not complete, because that needs to be validated with biological mechanisms. And this is, a, this is one of the favorite graphs. Uh, I, th I don't think any genome sequence analysis talk can do without this. Basically, we're sequencing many, many more genomes in all, the, all of the countries in the world, because genome sequencing cost has dropped significantly with the introduction of these high-throughput sequencing technologies. Basically, the cost is very little now. And as you can see, this is, uh, this is the Moore's Law curve. So it's, it's actually something that's scaling much better than Moore's Law today. We're, we're reducing the cost of genome sequence analysis. It's fun. Uh, OK, so what do we do with this? We know how to do the sequencing relatively well with the machines. Uh, uh, the next step in genome analysis is to basically solve the puzzle, figure out where these little fragments match in a reference genome. Assume that you have a reference genome for now, and we do today in, for most cases. Assembly is actually an even harder problem that requires even more computation. Uh, how, do you, how do you assemble this reference genome? Uh, after you figure out uh, uh, how, how these things map uh, to the reference genome, then you call the variants, basically say, oh, what are the places I differ? And now you can actually uh, do many, many analyses. Like you can say, oh, where does this uh, person differ in terms of uh, the interactions that I know with this drug or whatever, right? Or is this person vulnerable to some sort of cancer or not? So clearly, there's a, lot, there's a very interesting loop over here. It's scientific discovery, but also a personalized medicine here. This is one example question. If I give you a bunch of sequences, tell me where they're the same uh, and where they're different. And these are real examples that you can find online also. This is one of my favorite examples. You look at different species and figure out where they differ and basically correlate this with uh, different types of, uh, I don't know, whatever you're examining. 
and this another thing over here. And the difficulty is actually uh, humans are very similar to each other, even though they may have very different uh, opinions. <laughs> and I like this one also, human and banana. <laughs> Okay, many, many analyses can be enabled. For example, it's another one. Can you, given a bunch of short sequences, can you identify the approximate species of, uh, cluster of genomically unknown organisms, right? You may actually do this even without assembling the reference genome of, a, of an unknown uh, organism. Actually, people are using nanopore sequencing technology to, uh, uh, to, to identify different types of viruses uh, in Africa, for example, with those little devices today. Okay, so what is the problem? The problem is, going from this step to this step. We, this is easy, this is hard. And take this with a grain of salt, it really depends on the technology, and this also depends on the processing speed that you have. But basically there's a huge mismatch between the bandwidth throughput at which we can sequence things and throughput at which we can analyze uh, the genome. Basically, this read mapping is a very slow process. It could take one to two weeks, depending on how comprehensive you want to be on a single machine. Uh, and also, if further, you want to do analyses on top of that. You don't want this thing to take uh, one to two weeks or so. And this doesn't actually talk about, this talks about throughput, as you can see. It doesn't even talk about latency. Latency is even worse. Uh, okay, basically, we have a bottleneck in terms of read mapping. Uh, so what is read mapping? The, 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 what we want to do is to map many short DNA fragments, they're called reads, to a known reference genome with some minor differences allowed. Why are these minor differences allowed? Because there are mistakes in the machine, and also there are variants. So DNA logically looks like this. Physically, it's like this. It gets chopped into these pieces, and you want to map the pieces to a reference genome and solve the puzzle. But it's inherently an approximate process, actually. It's not perfect, so you need to do it multiple times to build confidence, but we're going to look at only once, even. Okay, it's challenging because you have billions of 50 to 300 base pair reads. So what are the challenges? You need to find, uh, if you want to be comprehensive, you don't want to miss anything. This means that you need to find many mappings of each read, and a short read can actually map to many, many locations, especially with these high throughput DNA sequencing technology that has reduced the cost significantly. How can we find all mappings efficiently? You need to tolerate some small variances or errors in each read, because each individual is different. Subject's DNA may be slightly different from uh, the uh, reference. You may have mismatches, insertions, and deletions. I'm gonna show you an example of this in a little bit. Uh, then the key question is how can we efficiently map each read with up to E errors present? And actually, people are trying to push E high today because you want to, uh, because of the, uh, as E increases, that your variation tolerance increases, and you may actually figure out different variants based on this. And as E increases, the complexity of the problem also increases. That's, down, that's a big downside. And you need to meet, map each read very fast. Performance is important. As I said, human DNA is about 3.2 billion base pairs long, which means that you get millions of reads. And state-of-the-art mappers take weeks to map a human's DNA, depending on how comprehensive you want to be. If you don't want to be comprehensive, you can be very quick, but you lose a lot of accuracy. Actually, that's a, that's a very interesting thing uh, in science today. If people are tolerating that loss of accuracy to get speed, but that may not be the right thing to do because you're, you're missing a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of mappings. So given this, how can we design a much higher performance read mapper? This is not a course on read mapping. I, I, I would love to talk a lot more about this read mapping. I'm not going to, but there are a lot of read mappers that are designed. This is uh, one of our read mappers. Uh, we designed uh, circa 2008 or so. It was published in 2009. It's open source, you can use it. Actually, there are, there are better uh, versions of it as I'm going to talk about. This is guaranteed to find all mappings uh, up to E errors. Uh, for, for a read, so it's very sensitive. It's one of the most sensitive mappers that are out there. That was our goal to begin with, uh, and we wanted to be fast also. But at the time we designed this mapper, it was fast, but it's not fast enough. So why is it not fast enough? Basically, it's spending all of its time doing what's called read alignment. Read alignment is edit distance computation. Edit distance computation, some of you may know, uh, there's Hamming distance. Hamming distance is by, by how many locations to equal length strings differ. Uh, that's easy to compute, actually. Whereas edit distance is the minimum number of edits, insertions, deletions, or substitutions needed to make the read exactly match a reference seg segment. So it turns out this is much harder to compute. So this is one example over here. If you want to compare, for example, if your reference uh, is organization and you read operation, basically you do the edit distance computation, and the, the edit distance computation is supposed to give you uh, oh, these, there are two insertions over here, 
because you've inserted two things to make the organization op or 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 pair over here. And there are five deletions over here because these things disappeared in the read and the rest is matches. So this is actually a costly computation to do and people have developed dynamic programming algorithms traditionally to do this computation. And there's a lot of work to accelerate this with better algorithms and better architectures as well, which I'm not going to go into. But apparently, essentially, the mapper spent most of its time for that purpose. And we analyzed the execution time. We figured out that actually the mapper is doing a lot of this edit distance computation. And most of the time, you're not going to find matches. What does that mean? You're not going to find uh, a, a read to match a reference portion because it's going to differ from that reference portion by, by more than E errors. Then our idea was, why are we doing all of this costly computation? Can we actually filter, figure that out much more quickly in some way? So basically the key idea of the works that I'm going to very briefly uh, go over, I'm not going to talk, go into the details, is to filter fast before you do this alignment. Before you do this approximate string comparison, uh, filter, have, design a filter that very quickly says, oh, this is going to match, this is not going to match. If it says it's not going to match, then don't do this costly edit distance comp com computation. And we found out that actually you can eliminate uh, more than 99% of these costly edit distance comp uh, computations this way. And that's, uh, that, that idea is proposed in this paper. You can actually download it and use it. This improved the mapper significantly. Uh, this takes advantage of the structure of the human genome uh, to get rid of these costly edit distance computation by doing these filterings much more efficiently. So of course now you have a trade-off, right? You have this filter and you have the edit distance computation. Now if this filter is taking a lot of time, you've shifted the bottleneck somewhere else. But it turns out you can build this filter to be much, much more efficient than edit distance computation because with a hash table, simple hash table lookup. Okay, I'm not gonna give you uh, the details of these works. This is actually worth a lecture, maybe six hours on its own, <laughs> or at least uh, one hour, but uh, Maybe if, if people are really interested at the end, we can squeeze uh, on Friday. So oh, what is, oh, yes? Oh, that's right, yes, I was going to say that actually. <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me do that pitch at the end, at the end of this uh, motivating detour. <laughs> You'll see that. Okay, so this was a pure software-based solution actually. Pure so purely in software, you can accelerate, this, this provides a speed up of about 20x uh, compared to a state-of-the-art mapper. But after that, uh, we looked into algorithm architecture co-design. It turns out actually, now you have this filter. This filter doesn't need to be perfect. Edit distance needs to be perfect if you want to match, uh, if you want to find all of the uh, uh, errors, uh, all of the uh, matches or mismatches comprehensively. But this filter just needs to tell you, oh, is it going to match, is it not going to match? If, if it makes errors, it's okay. You're going to still do the edit distance computation if you have a false positive in the filter. So we actually designed this filter to be much more approximate and took advantage of very bitwise operations and, and SIMD operations in a machine. And this actually speeds up. Uh, this introduced the concept of shifted hamming distance, if you will. Uh, you don't need to do a full edit distance in a filter, but if you actually do a hamming distance computation, and if you do the shifts to actually account for insertions and deletions, uh, you can actually get much better. Oh, I don't have a picture for this, sorry. <laughs> Anyway, we can, we can discuss this uh, offline during the breaks. I'd be happy to take any questions at any time also. But this actually improves the performance by about 3x. Uh, and then we went into more FPGA-based solutions more currently. Uh, here, this is like a very high overview slide, but basically uh, th this is the first FPGA-based alignment filter. The key idea is to implement, uh, uh, implement these, this filter in parallel in FPGA such that the FPGA can process many of these uh, reads in parallel very, very quickly. And the FPGA hardware is very customized to do this filtering very, very accurately uh, by taking advantage of something similar to the shifted timing distance actually. And this turns out this speeds up read mapping by about 10x uh, on top of what we've done before uh, with, the, with the customized hardware. And this is also online so you can actually download the source code, put it on your FPGA and try it out. I'd be happy to see. <laughs> Uh, people replicate results or uh, give us feedback. Okay, so why am I telling you all of this? Uh, this is really interesting. This, uh, I think th this is a very forward-looking application. It's still very forward-looking. It doesn't exist yet, in my opinion, that device that we, we're still imagining. We're not there yet. But the problem is these ap this application is very heavily bottlenecked by data movement, and it's just one example. The FPGA performance is limited by the DRAM bandwidth. We have actually a lot of computation units. We're limited by the DRAM bandwidth. We cannot do more. That's true for the shifted timing distance computation on the SIMD engines as well. 
Uh, and so more, more recently, we've started examining solutions like processing in memory uh, that can alleviate this bottleneck. However, uh, this is true for any accelerator, but even more so for processing in memory. We need to design mapping and filtering algorithms to fit processing in memory. So you really need to do application architecture co-design in this case. And maybe I will talk about this when we talk about processing in memory. This is one filter that we've designed that can accelerate read mapping by another 3x by pu pushing the computation uh, to the memory side. And 3x may sound low. I agree it's low. I think actually there's a lot more to do in this area. Uh, my belief is that you can go up to 10x, maybe 20x more if you push the computation over there. But there's also energy efficiency benefit that you get significantly by pushing the computation to the memory side in this case. Okay, I'm going to not talk about this because I already said a lot of these things. Uh, but I'm going to talk about something that may enable our dream. This was introduced in 2014, this Oxford Nanopore Technologies. They basically designed a new technology where they could uh, pass the DNA through nanoscale holes. And while the DNA is passing, they could measure the current through that nanoscale hole. And based on the current, they could guess whether you have AECTG. Of course, this is a confidence building mechanism, right? There's a lot of machine learning actually employed in this nanopore sequencing technology. And this can be done at dimensions of this sort. And as I said, people are actually using this in places like Africa to uh, sequence whatever they can find over there. Uh, and unfortunately, what they're doing right now is they're gathering the data, but they cannot do the analysis on the device. They cannot do the analysis on their laptops. What they're doing is they're sending all of that data to some data center, probably somewhere in the US or Europe or wherever. So there's a huge data movement that's happening. And clearly, they're not going to get their answer very quickly uh, with that, even though the device is very much capable of doing the sequencing relatively quickly on site, in place. So there's a massive amount of waste from my perspective. You, have, you build this device, and you're wasting all of the world's power to actually move the data from that device somewhere else. Right? But this is very interesting, because it, it actually has bottlenecks in many of these places. The first place is this raw signal current data. You need to call the basis. It's called base calling, meaning figure out ACTGs. And that is actually a very intensive process right now. This is one of the biggest uh, time consumers today. After that, you need to find some read, read overlaps. After that, you need to actually assemble. And after that, you need to do the read mapping, which we just discussed right now. And after that, you need to do the polishing to improve the accuracy. And eventually, you have an assembly of the genome of a species that you, you've never seen before. Uh, this is fascinating. And we've written a paper that talks about the tools uh, to analyze this. We're working on accelerating this pipeline as well at this point. I find this fascinating because I think we're getting uh, to the point where we could actually enable this device. Um, but as Leonid said, this is a very fascinating topic. If you're interested in this, there's an HPCA workshop uh, that uh, Leonid and Roman are organizing. Uh, it's called AACBB, I think. Uh, I don't remember what it stands for. <laughs> I gave, yeah, something good basically, but accelerating bioinformatics algorithms. And I, uh, I'm actually, I could actually talk a lot more, a lot longer uh, about this as well. And we have some new results that I didn't really even put here. I'd be happy to chat about this. But why did, why did I tell you this? Again, going back. Can we build devices that can analyze a genome within a minute? It's, there's still a long ways to go. Uh, and technology is part of it. But I think, really, the computational bottleneck is a, a huge part of this. We have devices today, but we don't know how to make them energy efficient. We don't know how to make them low latency. We don't know how to make them maybe secure. So, and this is, a lot of this is dictated by the huge memory bottleneck that we have today. We're really moving data unnecessarily. So I think this is a very motivating application for what we're going to discuss. Uh, maybe this application itself is not very capacity bottleneck, but it's really definitely bottleneck by the energy performance, uh, latency, and security uh, of the device. Any questions? I want to take this detour uh, to give an application. We're going to talk about other applications, a lot of other applications also. But I think we should always be looking forward to future applications that we can enable, uh, as opposed to backward to applications that we already really know well about. And I don't even know what we don't know right at this point. This, I have at least some idea of what, what, what might be enabled. OK, so now that I've covered this a little bit, now let's go into uh, the rest. Uh, and we're going to talk about memory and storage. Uh, and I'm going to start with motivation, of course. Why is memory so important, especially today? Uh, and it's going to become even more important, in my opinion. I'm going to give you perspectives from different directions. Maybe they're not going to be exactly covered this way. But there is a huge performance perspective, energy perspective, scaling, reliability, security perspective that I put together. 
And then we're going to delve into trends and challenges and opportunities in main memory. We're going to talk a lot about this part, uh, although sometimes we'll focus memories inside here, and we'll also focus on storage at some point. But let's start with this uh, main memory. Main memory is a critical component of all systems that we build today, whatever you're designing, server, mobile, embedded desktop, sensor, IoT, whatever you want to call it. It needs to have some sort of working storage. And this system must scale in many dimensions in terms of its size, capacity, cost, efficiency, uh, performance, and the algorithms we use to manage it to maintain the performance growth and the scaling benefits that we've been used to for a long time. And this part is not just processors and caches, of course. It's changing quite a bit. You have different sorts of heterogeneous accelerators, and they, get, they all get connected over here. And the fact that they're becoming more heterogeneous and they're demanding more from this main memory system is not helping. Basically, all of these are actually bottlenecked by main memory. In fact, GPUs are maybe more bottlenecked by main memory today. But if you look at an SOC today, memory control is really at the center of the things. Uh, everything is going through main memory, and memory controller is arbitrating those requests from all of those accelerators and different types of uh, processing units. Okay, this is my cartoonish picture. I, I drew this in Xfig in about 2005 or so. I still like using this because nothing really has changed that much. Uh, I don't know if you can, is it, is it okay? Is the light okay here? Okay. Basically, I have two points over here. One is computation is very little in a system where we design, uh, in a system we designed today. If you look at the cores, the red parts, uh, if you're colorblind, I, I'm sorry, I just pointed over here. I, I chose terrible color, colors. Basically, these red parts are the cores, and they're the only places where we do computation. Everything else is there to store data, move data, store data, move data, control the data movement and storage, store data, move data, store data, move data, and you keep going to the outside system, you keep storing and moving data. Most of the system is dedicated to storing and moving data, not doing computation. And if, if you look inside the core, most of the core is dedicated to storing and moving data. There's an L1 cache that I didn't draw here. There is a register file that's data storage and interconnect that's moving data. So if you actually do the calculation, it depends on the system, of course, but more than 90% of the system is really dedicated to moving and storing data. Computation, which is really what we build computers for, is a very little part of the system today. Uh, and the second point over here is this stuff that stores and moves data, interconnects, caches, controllers, memory, storage, they're all shared. Especially when you go outside the cores, they're all shared between the cores, which means that these cores, when they go out there with their request, they interfere with each other, and that interference becomes a problem. Okay, this is in one slide, a very quick state of the main memory system uh, slide. Uh, there are some recent technology, architecture, and application trends that lead to some new requirements from the system and that exacerbate some old requirements. And we've always demanded a lot from memory. We're demanding a lot more going forward. And I don't think this demand is going to end anytime soon. Hopefully, in this course, we will talk a lot about DRAM and memory controllers. And hopefully, I will show you that uh, as we design them today, these components are not able to satisfy the requirements that we want from them. Even at this point, they're failing, actually. They're going to fail even more if we keep the same design principles. And in this course, we're also going to cover some emerging memory technologies that happen to be non-volatile. These enable some new opportunities, like merging of memory and storage, and also perhaps in-memory computation, that they may be more uh, viable to uh, connect uh, uh, logic and memory together at the, in the same substrate. So given this, I believe we need to rethink the entire main memory system and the systems we design around it today uh, to fix the issues we're having with existing technologies and enable some of these emerging technologies, maybe at least one. But it's always good to enable more, while satisfying all of the requirements. OK, let's go into these trends a little bit more. I'm a bit uncomfortable, because when I move my hands, I hear this fluffing noise. It's not nice, but I'll try to not move my hands. <laughs> so these are three uh, major trends that are affecting main memory as I see uh, them today. Basically, we want more performance, more capacity, more bandwidth, more quality of service, more predictability, lower latency. We, uh, energy and power is a key system design concern. And on top of this, the technology scaling of DRAM is ending. And we relied a lot on DRAM so far. We're going to cover uh, these very quickly. Uh, so why are we driving the requirements for ban bandwidth, capacity, and quality of service? Because computation is not a problem. Applications are increasingly uh, data intensive. And we want to be more efficient. These are basically summarizing these three points. Computation is not a problem, which means that we can put 
many cores, many agents, many accelerators uh, on a single die. And we actually, Moore's law is continuing very nicely in my opinion. Basically, we can, we can keep, keep putting many more transistors. And we know how to design these computation units quite well. As a result, we're increasing the number of them. If we're not bottlenecked by memory bandwidth actually, or memory capacity, we could put even more of these things uh, on a single chip. Applications are increasingly data intensive. I gave you an example of this from bioinformatics just now, but there are many, many other, other applications that we're gonna look at, graph processing, databases. We have a huge amount of data, and it's not going to change. And we want to consolidate more and more, basically for efficiency reasons, for uh, energy efficiency, cost efficiency, building efficiency, cooling efficiency. You want to make use of a single piece of hardware such that they, it executes many things at the same time. And this is a trend in many uh, devices today. Uh, and as you put many things on a single piece of hardware that is bottlenecked by memory, you need to increase the capacity bandwidth quality of service requirements up. Okay, let me, let's quantify some of these things uh, very quickly. This is uh, actually a picture that I borrow from a paper that was written by HP Labs at University of Michigan in ISCA 2009, as old as that. Uh, basically, these folks analyzed how core count was doubling approximately every two years and how DRAM DIMM capacity was also doubling approximately every three years, which means that there's a disparity between these two exponential trends, right? Memory capacity is not increasing as fast as core count. Now, you could always take issue with these slides. I think their data points end at 2010. Is it really happening still in the general purpose domain? Is it really happening still in the C GPU domain? What about the FPGAs? What about the accelerators? How do you actually uh, define a core? There are a lot of issues. But it's clear that this trend is continuing. And if it's not continuing, it's partially or mostly because of the fact that memory is not keeping up. Because people are finding that you cannot supply more cores with memory bandwidth and capacity. They're not putting more cores on a chip even though they're able, able to. So clearly there's a disparity. And at the time they wrote this paper, they said memory capacity per core is expected to drop by 30% every two years, which is not good. This means that a software thread now has less memory to play with, to deal with. As a result, uh, software has always relied on having more memory to have more features. And if that goes away, then you have a problem. And this is actually the burden that multi-core also puts on the software, which we can talk about separately. Okay, so this is the capacity trend. The bandwidth trend is actually even worse. Memory bandwidth is not increasing as fast as the capacity, as I will show you in the next slide in a little bit. We'll have fun with the next slide. Memory bandwidth is actually increasing by about 10% every year, give or take. 3D technology is going to make it much better. Well, they already made it much better. But still, it's not as fast as capacity, which means that we are able to put many, many agents or computation units on a single die and in the bigger system also, but we're not able to supply it, supply them with memory uh, capacity and bandwidth. Basically, we can, we're starving them. Okay, let's have some fun uh, with this slide over here. In this slide, Basically, we're going to analyze the last 18 years of DRAM, the DDR devices, the, the most common device, DRAM device of the day. And we're gonna look at how much it has improved in, in terms of capacity, bandwidth, and latency. And I'm gonna ask some questions. What do you think about capacity? Over the last 18 years, how much did DRAM improve in terms of capacity? 100 times. Any other guesses? Okay, I'll take 100. That's actually a good approximation. It's actually about 128X. And this actually, you can think of it as Moore's law. Moore's law is alive and well, and people have uh, driven it. As a result, we, put, we can put more bits per, uh, bits per area. But as you can see, it's slowed down recently. So even this capacity, which the chip is really optimized for by the DRM manufacturers today, even that is uh, seeing problems. And we're gonna talk about why that is the case in the next lecture today, hopefully. Uh, so, uh, but DRM manufacturers actually optimize for capacity cost per bit, and this is the main driver that they have. And now that they're making a lot of money, they're not going to change their mindset for a while, which is really sad for the entire uh, ecosystem of the world, in my opinion. But I think emerging technologies can push, and maybe that will also change how DRM behaves. Okay, anyway, without digressing, let's talk about bandwidth. How, how much do you think bandwidth has improved in the DDR technology uh, over the last 18 years? Bandwidth improvements usually come from, yes? Times 10. Times 10, that's a good. About half of that. Half of that, 64x. Okay, actually, you're, it's in between. <laughs> it's about 20x. <laughs> and this is the most common DDR device. There are some different DDR devices. Like GDDR is very different, of course. That's designed for high bandwidth, but that sacrifices latency. 
So bandwidth improvements actually come from uh, frequency improvements uh, or pin uh, the number of pins increasing, right? Meaning uh, it's li either limited by power or cost. Usually if you pay more money, you get more bandwidth in general. Uh, but of course, we're not, uh, uh, we're not as rich as we want to be. As a result, we're limited by something, right? So we get 20x, which is not bad. What about latency? 3, 4x. 3, 4x. 1x, <laughs> 2x, 0.5x, meaning it's gone, it's increased. <laughs> actually, it's increased in some technologies. It's, it is actually increased in some of the recent technologies. But yes, I think you're on the ballpark. Some of you are more, uh, <laughs> more optimistic, but <laughs> this, is the, this is the real data. I was actually surprised. I, 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 I saw this as always almost flat, but it has improved by about 30%. Uh, we're going to go back to latency. Uh, and this is, uh, I mean, this is partially because latency is fundamentally hard. There's no question about that. Reducing latency is a lot harder than improving capacity. And partially because of that, the business has built, uh, the, the memory business has been built on increasing capacity and driving this cost per bit. Of course, capacity is important as you put more things. Like this, is, this has been enabled because of capacity mainly, right? Uh, we're going to get back to that also. Uh, this, this is fundamentally hard, but it's also because of the mindset as well. And we're going to talk about that mindset uh, when we talk about latency. Yes? <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you, if, you, if you have combined measures, then it becomes a little bit more difficult. Maybe, that, that may be true, actually, but now you're, you're putting latency and bandwidth together, probably. Because clock rate affects both bandwidth and part of the latency. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. So this doesn't take into account the CPU side of things. This, take, this just looks at the DRAM device itself. You're right, if you look at, yeah, this is, I don't know how many megahertz, and this is probably six gigahertz or so no, right now. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yes, absolutely. So this doesn't look at the relative distance, but the relative distance from the CPU has increased even more because CPU latencies are uh, much, uh, much lower uh, here compared to here. Yes, that's a very good point. Yes. So the late, this is the decrease, basically this is improvement. Hopefully improvement is decreased in latency, yes. Say again, this is log scale as you can see, 1, 10, 100. Yeah. Basically, it has, basically it has, latency has reduced by about 30% in the last 18 years. Okay, but there are clear trade-offs that we're going to talk about actually. In some recent technologies like LPDDR4, 5, they actually reduce power, but they also increase latency. Uh, so they're, they're, they're interesting trade-offs, which we will talk about later on. So this is focused on latency because it's the hardest problem, in my opinion, over here. We're going to spend time on. Uh, and many applications are uh, bottlenecked by many things. These are, from my perspective, backward-looking applications, especially this. This thing over here, I think Spark is relatively backward looking. Uh, but clearly there are many in-memory databases, graph tree processing that's very fundamental, a lot of data center workloads. People have shown over and over that latency matters a lot uh, over here. But then all of these applications are also bound by memory capacity, memory bandwidth, and many other things. So these are applications that have been driving memory performance significantly. But even though they're very bottleneck by memory latency, latency has not improved a lot. And as a result, actually, we've improved the latency tolerance mechanisms in the CPUs, and that has come at the system cost, which we will talk about later on. Okay, yeah, maybe in terms of latency, one more slide over here. I'm going to use that later on again. But Dick Seitz, when he actually designed the Alpha uh, 21264 processor, he was the chief architect of that. He wrote this short microprocessor research, uh, report article and he basically said it's the memory stupid. That's the title of the article, actually. And basically what he says in the article is, we designed this processor to complete four instructions per cycle, but it's completing one instruction every four cycles. So it's operating at 1 16th of its bandwidth. And he basically said it's waiting for memory most of the time. And this is 1995 or so. Uh, this is data from something close to my heart, my own PhD thesis uh, in 2003. I still use the slide. Basically, we analyzed a lot of applications that Intel was using at the time to design microprocessors with, and we found out that more than 50% of the time, the processor is waiting for main memory, L2 cache misses. And I'm gonna show you later 
a study by Google in 2015. It's not on these slides. Uh, in 2015, that basically looks at all of the data center applications with the most recent, at the time, uh, processors that they're using. They basically show the same thing. More than 50% of the time, the data center, the processor is waiting for memory. So essentially, nothing has changed in the last 20 years, even though processor performance has improved significantly, of course, in the last 20 years. But we're, we're missing something in memory, in my opinion. Okay, so the so, so second major trend is energy and power. Clearly, this is important everywhere, but main memory energy and power is increasing relatively. Uh, and there are really interesting data points. This is uh, an IBM paper, IBM research paper from 2003, Charles Lefergie and others. They, they examined the power consumption of memory in their systems, big iron systems of the day. They show that 40 to 50% of the entire system energy is spent on the off-chip memory hierarchy. At that time, the off-chip memory hierarchy consisted of the, uh, the off-chip caches, off-chip interconnect, off-chip DRAM, off-chip storage. Uh, fast forward, IBM Power 8, this is a nice paper also, they analyzed, again, real system power. They basically said more than 40% of the entire system power is in DRAM, just in DRAM, because a lot of the other stuff went into the chip and DRAM stayed off. As a result, it's consuming a lot of power. And similar uh, studies have been done for GPUs, showing that more than 40% of the GPU system power is on DRAM. And we've done similar studies, which I'm going to talk about later on. And one of the issues with DRAM is it consumes power even when it's not used. Like this is, for example, doing a lot of self-refresh in most of its DRAM, maybe all of its uh, DRAM today. And we're wasting a lot of energy. Uh, and if this was a longer course, I would have the students who are here calculate how much energy is wasted in a one exabyte memory system for just refresh. Okay, this actually ties into the next topic because refresh is a fundamental issue with DRAM. How uh, you need to fundamentally uh, refresh the data that's in a cell and you need to determine how often you need to refresh it. And as the cell technology scales down to smaller technology nodes, it becomes fundamentally much more difficult to figure out how often you need to refresh DRAM. And the refresh rate also increases. And partially because of this, DRAM technology scaling is ending. We're going to talk about that. Okay, but one more thing about energy before we talk about that. This is a slide that you can argue uh, with a lot of numbers, uh, about a lot of numbers with. Uh, but if, if this is a slide that I borrow from Bill Daly's IP keynote. Basically, if you look over here, uh, today a 64-bit double precision floating point operation is very cheap in terms of energy with some technology assumptions, 20 picojoules. A DRAM read or write is very expensive about 16 nanojoules. And I took the liberty of rounding up 800x to 1000x, but we're gonna look at more realistic numbers uh, later on. Now given this, uh, does it make sense? If you, want, if you don't have a lot of locality and if you want to do a floating point addition on two different data items and write it back to somewhere else in memory, does it make sense to do three memory accesses to uh, accomplish this very simple double, double precision floating point operation? I'll ask that question here. If you actually go back 70 years later and try to do the calculation, figure out it's, very, it's not very easy, but it used to, this used to cost about two orders of magnitude more than this memory access. So we've actually moved five orders of magnitude to the other side in the scale, yet we're still bringing data into the processor to be processed. Okay, I'm foreshadowing some of the things that we're going to cover. Okay, uh, on top of all of this, as I said, DRM technology scaling is ending. Uh, and ending is actually not a very strong word. Uh, I was using this term uh, in 2012 or so. Now everybody's using this term, which is nice, I think. Uh, but actually, uh, when I was using this term uh, in, in MemCon conference in 2013, some folks from Samsung actually came and said the same thing. <laughs> so that was very, that was very uh, reassuring. But it's very clear. I mean, it's obvious if you look at uh, the technology scaling of DRAM. And people have been projecting that DRAM will not easily scale below X nanometers. X nanometers is the future size of a DRAM cell. And I like using X over here because as people change the projection, projections, I don't need to keep my slides coherent. <laughs> this, is the, this is the lazy, <laughs> symbolic, symbolic coherence, if you will. <laughs> Any kind of X will go over here. Uh, but as you reduce the size of the future size of the cell, as you reduce X, you get a lot of benefits, or we've gotten a lot of benefits so far. Clearly density, right? You get higher capacity, higher, no, more bits per area. You get lower cost, reasonable energy, maybe not lower anymore, but reasonable energy scaling going forward. How much is the platform area of scale? We're going to talk about that. <laughs> maybe I'll ask you that question a little bit. <laughs> uh, actually, yeah, okay, let's, let's get back to that. <laughs> So if this ends, then we're gonna have a huge difficulty uh, over here satisfying all of the other requirements. 
So let's talk about what Ronnie uh, mentioned in a, little, uh, in a little bit more detail. Basically, what is the fundamental problem? If you look at any memory technology, any memory technology needs to have a storage device and an access device. And both of these need to work reliably and correctly for the memory technology to work well. In DRAM, the storage device is the capacitor. And the access device is the access transistor, the bit line, and the sense amplifier, and the circuitry around it, basically. And for DRAM to work, this capacitor must be large enough for reliable sensing, and this access transistor should be large enough for low leakage and high retention time. And clearly, the sense amplifier needs to have good noise. But we're not going to talk about this part a lot right now. Uh, we're going to talk about the cell, because reducing the cell has enabled a lot of the benefits. Uh, so as you reduce x, you reduce both. And both of these properties become difficult to maintain. And this was basically the value that was assigned to x in 2009 by ITRS. ITRS said scaling below 35 nanometers is challenging. They didn't say it will end at 35 nanometers. That would be very uh, not so reasonable of them to say. <laughs> Whenever you say something will end, somebody will find a way of making sure that it doesn't end. Uh, but they said it's challenging, and they were actually right. Can, can people guess where we are right now in terms of x? Like, what is the future size of DRAM? Uh, about this number? OK. Any other guesses? 30? OK. Don't be fooled by this number. DRAM manufacturers worked hard to 14. OK, that's much, much closer to where we are today. Today, we're around 17 nanometers. So clearly, we're much below what ITRS said. So we've actually overcome the challenge. But it's becoming even more challenging right now to go below. And when I actually go and give these lectures at DRAM companies, I like asking the question, like, what keeps you up at night? And how, how much do you think we're going to scale down? What is, what is the limit of x? And the best value that I've gotten from a DRAM engineer was 7. That's actually much higher than what some of the emerging technologies are already being manufactured with, maybe not at mass scale, but at actually uh, in terms of technology. So 7 is actually very optimistic. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see if we reach it. So we, we reached 17, but this has come at a cost. And we're going to talk about that reliability challenges. We're having a lot of issues with DRM reliability and errors. OK. So let's, let's talk a little bit more about this. This is actually not a very fundamental problem with charge-based technologies. DRAM is one example, but flash also is very charge-based. Uh, as you reduce the size of the flash cell, you run into very similar problems. And uh, in flash, we actually were almost hitting a scaling limit until the manufacturers figured out how to stack these flash cells in a three-dimensional manner more recently. So that alleviated the scaling problem for a while. But as, we, as the push for capacity increases, there is no other way uh, to improve uh, the capacity other than stacking more, which has a limit, and, or reducing the size of the cell. And once you start reducing the size of the cell, you're going to go back to the same sort of reliability issues. So this is one example. We're going to cover this more. But we've done this study with Facebook uh, around 2014 or so. And we basically analyzed all of the memory errors that they've collected over the course of one and a half years or so. There's a lot of data in this paper. I'm going to point out just one. This is a correlational study. We don't control everything because this is production data center uh, data. Basically, we found out that there's a strong correlation between the error rate that you get from memory and the chip density that's employed in the server. So as the chip density increases, the server failure rate increases. And if you really want to understand what this is, you should really look at the paper because there has to be a normalized metric over here uh, that looks at the control set of servers. But you can almost see a linear relationship over here, as, uh, as you can see. And the key is, because these chips uh, have more cells that are packed together, uh, they're affecting each other. As a result, reliability has reduced, and we see more errors in the field. And we're going to, see, we're going to look at more errors also. If you're interested, then you can take a look at this. So we've been building infrastructures to understand such issues. Uh, I'm going to talk a lot more about this when we talk about reliable today. This is one example infrastructure where we actually designed FPGAs that are soft memory controllers, memory testers. And we can test memory. And we've been finding out different characteristics, uh, some of which are known to DRM manufacturers, but they don't like talking about it, some of which are not known to DRM manufacturers. And uh, I think this is really interesting. We're going to talk about that. But if you're really interested in testing DRAM, this is also open source. We've open sourced it recently. It's more easy to program. You can actually use a C++ API uh, to actually send commands to the memory controller and test whatever DRAM is attached to it. 
and we'd be happy to support it. You can download the source code from our GitHub. Uh, we'd love to encourage uh, experiments. And people have already started using it, actually. Uh, they put the, I've seen several papers on archive that uh, use this infrastructure. Uh, we don't supply the FPGAs. They, they bought their own FPGAs, but <laughs> they use the RTLs. OK, and that's the paper. And we're going to talk about issues like this. Uh, like one can actually today predictably induce errors in most DRAM memory chips. I'm not going to go into the details of this right now, but probably some of you are familiar with it. This is the Rohammer phenomenon. Basically, you, you induce these bit flips in a predictable manner. As a result, this becomes a system security vulnerability. So this is the relationship between reliability and security. If you're not reliable, you actually cause many, many other problems. And I like this, uh, pointing this out because I, this is really where we are at in terms of hardware security. This was written uh, based on Rohammer in 2016, but I think this is going to be more important going into the future with the uh, uh, security issues that we're seeing today. Forget software, hackers are exploiting physics or fundamental architectural characteristics to take advantage of, uh, to basically launch security attacks. Okay, we're gonna talk about this one also. Basically, there's a reliability and security perspective in terms of DRAM scaling. Uh, this is going to become much worse. Okay, let's talk about like some of the broad solutions that have been developed. This is another trend that I want to cover. DRAM scaling has already become increasingly difficult because of various issues. Uh, as a result, or in parallel with this, people have been developing emerging memory technologies. 3D stack DRAM is one example. It gives you higher bandwidth, reduced latency DRAM, hopefully at low cost, it gives you lower latency. Low power DRAM, which is I think really interesting uh, going forward, it gives you lower power and clearly non-volatile or emerging memory technologies, they have larger capacity and better scaling benefits. I picked some of the benefits over here. We're going to be more comprehensive in some of them later on. But the point of this slide is there is a red area that I didn't show, which I'm going to put over here. There is no memory technology that's green at every metric that we want it to be green at. All memory technologies provide a trade-off. As I said, low power DRAM is great, but it comes at higher latency and higher cost. Uh, so given this landscape, it makes sense to do something like this. Basically, people have moved on to heterogeneous or hybrid main memory systems where you have different types of memories put together, hopefully with complementary characteristics, and you design the hardware and the software to manage the data allocation and movement to achieve the greens of each technology as much as possible while avoiding the reds as much as possible. And this is already a trend. This is going, going forward. It's not going to change. And I think it's kind of, in hindsight, it's also obvious. It was obvious at the time as well when people were developing it. If, if, the, if heterogeneity is a fundamental principle for, uh, for CPUs uh, or, or computation, why not do it for memory also? But the memory design space is actually very, very interesting going forward. And there's uh, much less work done on the heterogeneity uh, of memory compared to the heterogeneity of computation. So I'll foreshadow this. If you have a system like this, you need an intelligent controller. There's no way you'll, you'll keep the controller dumb over here just read or write, and not understand what's going on in terms of what's happening to the access of the data in these different types of technologies. Because you need a controller that manages the data movement and allocation. If you just punt uh, the data allocation and movement only to the software, you have a problem because these technologies are extremely fast and the software is very slow to adapt. So you need a controller that's intelligent. So that's going to be my first foreshadowing of intelligent memory controllers. I'm going to build this up a little bit. Uh, until we get to in-memory computation. Okay, industry is actually writing papers about it too. DRAM scaling problem, we're going to cover a little bit more. I like this paper that's written by Samsung and Intel, two companies that don't normally talk to each other, <coughs> but they were nice enough to write a paper to Memory Forum uh, in 2014. And they basically said refresh is a fundamental problem in DRAM. We're going to talk a lot more about that. Uh, as you reduce the uh, size of the cell, leakage current increases and uh, retention time becomes difficult, and also retention time becomes difficult to determine because the retention time of a cell changes randomly due to quantum-like effects, which we're going to go into. That's called variable retention time phenomenon. They also said write latencies are also increasing. I believe this is a bit less fundamental uh, and maybe more tolerable, but it's also important. But uh, the more interesting thing uh, that's relevant to what I've been uh, developing so far is they also say, oh, we need intelligent memory controllers. We want to have controllers a little bit more intelligent so that we can overcome uh, the ugly parts of technology in DRAM. Okay, any questions so far? I'm gonna cover some, some more of these trends. Yes?
Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I think it's, it's an open design space. We're going to see examples of different things. In my, in my opinion, it should be software programmable. Uh, even, even in terms of scheduling policies, maybe you have some, some of these libraries that you provide to the programmer or system software, and the system software chooses which one to use at a given point in time. So I think it needs to know more about the device, and it needs to know more about the application at the same time. That's the, that's the best, in my opinion. <laughs> but we're going to see examples of this. Clearly, it's not going to happen overnight, <laughs> getting both of that information. Okay. So, okay, let me talk about one orthogonal issue that I intend to cover in this course also. Uh, hopefully, we'll get to it. Regardless of whatever you do in main memory, uh, it doesn't matter what technology you have over here. As long as it's a shared medium between uh, these agents that are accessing it, you have a fundamental interference problem. Cores or agents interfere with each other when accessing shared memory. Their requests contend uh, for main memory, different structures inside the main memory. As a result, they delay each other. And if you don't control it, in some form, it leads to many problems. It leads to starvation, it leads to fairness problems, it leads to quality of service issues. You cannot satisfy guarantees of some of these different cores. For example, if you want the frames per rec second guarantee, you may not be able to satisfy it if you're not aware of the interference over here. And this is becoming worse. In my opinion, this is going to become even more worse, uh, especially when uh, the CPU uh, or, or the computation side is becoming more heterogeneous. You have different so sorts of agents that are injecting requests into the memory controller, and they have different sorts of hierarchies built into them. And you have different sorts of memories that are becoming even more hybrid over here. So it's not becoming a nice landscape. Uh, there, there, there's interference between all of these agents and different types of memories. So this quality of service or predictable performance or performance problem is going to increase. And uh, one question that we will hopefully tackle in the later part of this course is, how do we allocate resources to these heterogeneous agents to mitigate interference and provide predictable performance. As I said, the memory control is in the center of things in this thing, and it kind of, this thing looks like, kind of looks like that, even though this is a much simpler version of what is inside here, in my opinion. There are a lot more accelerators here, for example. Uh, okay. So I think this is another foreshadowing. <laughs> if you have some system like this, you need to have an intelligent memory control that understands the requirements of the applications, and that also understands the characteristics of the underlying memories to be able to do, uh, do this job well. Okay, so let's uh, not switch gears, but continue what we're discussing. Basically, we want to talk about solutions also. I'm going to uh, go through some broad strokes first. How do we solve the problem? And this is going to be a, a, an example of uh, like broad abstract of what we're going to cover. So fixing it <laughs> is a good solution direction. Basically, we, we keep the same technology somehow, but make memory and controllers more intelligent. This requires, in my opinion, new interfaces, maybe application interfaces, new interface to the memory, new functions, and new architectures. I call it the system memory co-design. The second solution direction, in my opinion, is eliminating or minimizing it. If we can find a technology that augments DRAM or gets rid of DRAM somehow, that's great. And this is very interesting because there are some new technologies that may potentially do this. I'm not sure if they're all good, but they, they may actually threaten at least DRAM in some way. And this enables a system-wide rethinking of memory as well as storage, because these technologies happen to be non-volatile as well. And the third direction, which is also very interesting in my opinion, is embracing the problem. Meaning that, okay, we have these memories that are not perfect, so have these heterogeneous combinations of memories and map data intelligently across them. And this is true for reliability also. Maybe some memories are extremely reliable, some are not reliable, or you consciously designed them to be reliable and unreliable and you put them together and you map data intelligently across them and that way you scale the uh, memory uh, system. There may, maybe there are other things, I'd be happy to hear your opinion on this also, but it's not clear that any of the solutions is going to be easy. Basically, we need software, hardware, and device cooperation and we need to understand how these things operate together uh, to, to be able to enable some of these solutions. So we need to think across the stack, if you will. So I'm going to talk about two solution directions. Uh, do we normally take a break? That's a long, what do you think? This is a two hour lecture, which is relatively long. But say it again? Up to me, okay. Maybe we should take a four minute break. <laughs> so that people, that will, no? not uh, that will not work, okay. No, the... <laughs> how, how long will work that? <laughs> 
So we need to be done by 12, right? If I understand correctly, for lunch. Who wants to, okay, let's do, let's do it democratic way, which may not be the best form of governance, but. <laughs> so who wants a break right now? Like five minutes. Who doesn't want a break right now? Okay, okay, then it's five minutes, but I'll start after five minutes. <laughs>
Okay, shall we get started? <laughs> so you're going, you're going to leave your fellow students behind outside? Okay, we're getting started. Let me, let me pull it, <laughs> close the door, okay? That helps, I guess. Time to get started. <laughs> I know Ronnie can pull, pull everyone in. <laughs> I see. This is really annoying, actually. I don't know. Sometimes we hear, sometimes we don't hear much of this. Yeah, maybe it's a connection issue. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but there's nothing. Yeah, yeah, it's not an echo, you're right. Sorry, I want to test it a bit. When you test it, you don't see it. This is like a retention fault. Maybe I don't know how to test it. Okay. Maybe I cleaned it. From there? Is there a microphone here? I'm not sure. Maybe inside there? Yeah, okay. If they can turn it off, but yeah, it's started again. Oh, I see. Let's try it, yeah, okay. Is it better? Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Anyway. We'll try our best. Okay. Okay, let's continue. Uh, basically, we were talking about, yes, how do we solve the problem? I'm going to uh, go through a brush, uh, like uh, a broad overview. We'd like to overcome memory shortcomings with more memory-centric design. I think new memory architectures, new interface, and new functions. We're going to talk about that. And better waste management. We're actually wasting a lot in memory today. Uh, there are many studies that show that if you look at main memory, more than 30% of store zeros. I think that's a huge waste if you actually are storing, wasting all of your capacity for storing zeros. And people have been developing compression algorithms or uh, deduplication algorithms to minimize that waste. But this is actually endemic. It's not just in capacity, but it's also in bandwidth. So we're actually bringing huge cache blocks. Maybe we're using only eight bits of a cache block or one word of a cache block, and the rest of the cache block is wasted. That's a bandwidth waste. And we're wasting a lot of latency also. Latencies are specified to, for operation at the worst case opera operating conditions, 85 degrees Celsius. If you're operating at 30 degrees Celsius, you actually have a lot of slack. You don't need to wait uh, for memory to respond uh, for that long. As a result, we're wasting pretty much everything that we care about uh, today. So if we actually do better waste management, that could enable us to uh, do, do better in memory. So there are several key issues to tackle over here. I think we've talked about reliability, enabling that at low cost, which will lead to even higher capacity. I think that's really important. Reducing energy is important. These actually are two sides of the same coin. They go, uh, they're at odds with each other. Reducing latency is important. Uh, improving bandwidth and reducing waste, as we discussed. One solution which we will talk about that uh, can help a lot of these at the same time is enabling computation close to data. I think this is really uh, going to be important going into the future. And that will change how we think about memory systems. Uh, that will also change how we think about programming models also. And maybe things like coherence, virtual memory. Uh, I think that will be, oh, that will all be impacted by if, if you actually uh, put computation somewhere else as opposed to the processor. Okay, that's very interesting. I'm going to cover a bunch of issues over here, starting from fundamentals to more recent research. Uh, and, okay, these are some of the recent research that we're doing over here <laughs> in the last few years. Uh, okay, the second solution direction is emerging memory technologies. Uh, basically, this is, I think this is fascinating, and this could also change a lot in the software, and we're going to cover a lot about this. There are some emerging memory technologies that are resistive, that are more scalable than DRAM. As a result, they're very promising, and they're non-volatile on top of this. 
they're more scalable because they're resistive. And one example is phase change memory. This is really old technology. It's used in rewritable CDs. When we talk about it, we'll talk about like how it became more interesting today. It became more interesting today because read devices for it that actually uh, detect the material's resistance have become much more reliable and fast. In rewritable CDs, you use optical uh, methods for reading by shining light on things. But that's a very slow reading process. If you want to use this as your computer's main memory, you need the read device to be fast. Uh, and data is stored by changing the phase of material and you detect the material's resistance. And people actually prototyped this at very low nanometers when people were saying, oh, the ARM cannot easily scale below 35 nanometers, right? As you can see over here. And this number has been updated many times. I think the l lowest number I've seen is maybe three nanometers or so uh, over here. So uh, this is one example of a technology. I'm not taking sides with any technology. I know there's a lot of very interesting work over here uh, that are on memristors. I think they're also very interesting. Our RAM is very interesting. Uh, but a lot of these technologies are resistive. They're fundamentally similar in, the sum, in that sense, but they're also very, very different in terms of their characteristics. Uh, all of these are expected to be denser than DRAM because they can actually store multiple bits per cell because you can chop up the resistance range into uh, many windows, whereas it's very difficult to do that in DRAM. Chopping up the charge range in a capacitor is very difficult. First of all, charge is very small. Second, if you chop it up, you need very sensitive uh, sensing mechanisms, and that, that actually blows up your sense amplifier to be extremely large. The sense amplifier today in DRAM is already very large. It's more than 100 times the size of a cell. Okay, but the problem is these emerging technologies have many other shortcomings that are not written here. The key question is can we somehow enable them to replace, augment, or surpass DRAM? Surpass is interesting because they can surpass DRAM because they're non-volatile. You can actually operate on persistent data in place. And we're going to talk about that when we talk about the emerging memory technologies uh, lecture. And these are some of the works that we're doing in the area. Okay, combination is basically uh, hybrid memory systems. Uh, it's not clear if we're going to do with only one technology, but you can combine multiple different technologies as well and design the hardware and the software to manage data allocation and movement as we've discussed before. We're going to talk about this also when we talk about emerging technologies. This is one example that I want to foreshadow. Uh, if you actually uh, ha are able to design hybrid memories, you can take advantage of the application characteristics. Imagine an application. Many applications have these characteristics. Imagine an application where this data is very sensitive to errors inside memory. If you get a fault in a data structure, a pointer to a critical data structure, you, the application basically crashes. Or you get a system security vulnerability that may be harder to measure. So that you want to protect. This is very vulnerable. Whereas some other part of the application, you get an error, some part of the data that is approximate to begin with, you don't really care. The vulnerability is extremely low. If you can actually classify your data into shades of gray, or black and white in this case, uh, vulnerable and tolerant, maybe you can also design your memory explicitly to fit the characteristics of these different sorts of data, reliable and low cost. These are examples only. And you have a much better system in the end. This is the idea of heterogeneous reliability memory. I, I'm going to talk about this uh, more later on. But I think this is a very promising direction because this can be any technology, and this can be explicitly designed. And also, of course, there's a huge hardware software co-design space here. We did this a study uh, with Microsoft. We actually, one of my students went and uh, modified their web search application uh, in a coarse grain uh, in terms of its vulnerability and tolerance uh, to errors and partitioned the data. And he showed that you could actually reduce the hardware cost in a data center by about 4 to 5%. Why? Because you get rid of all of, the, all of the data center is designed assuming you will get errors. But most of the time, you don't get errors. Or when you get errors, you don't, it doesn't matter. So you can get rid of a lot of the ECC memory, high cost ECC memory from the system. And actually, you can design some of the memory to be not so well tested if you don't really care about the errors that you get in parts of your data. And I think with more uh, approximate applications, like if you're doing training on huge amounts of data sets and you have some error tolerance, and if your memory provides error tolerance, that's better than what your error tolerance is to begin with, you can actually do this sort of uh, optimization. OK, we may talk about that more. And this is the paper uh, if you're interested. OK, uh, we'll talk about memory interference very quickly. Uh, memory interference between cores is uncontrolled. As a result, you get unfairness, starvation, and low performance, which means that you have an uncontrollable, unpredictable, and vulnerable system. If you co-locate two applications together, you don't know how they will interact. Uh, 
the solution that we are going to discuss is more quality of service aware memory systems. It's a hardware software cooperative solution again. You need to design the hardware to provide a configurable fairness substrate such that you can tell the memory controller prioritize this application for example or tell the memory controller these are the guarantees that this application requires and that needs to be told by the software. Right? So we're going to talk about some of the mechanisms to provide quality of service and how the software can control them. This is very quickly, I think this is, uh, this is pushing the boundaries is going to be important. How do, we, how do we provide very strong memory service guarantees? Uh, we would like to really satisfy performance and service level agreement requirements in the presence of shared main memory, heterogeneous agents, and hybrid memory and storage. How do we actually do that? I think there are multiple approaches that we will examine, but I think a very promising approach is to build models, online models hopefully, that can accurately estimate how much an application is losing performance because of interference from other applications in the system, in the resources. How do we do that? I think how do you build an accurate model is really interesting. Uh, on top of that, of course, you need mechanisms in the hardware and the software so that you can do the resource partitioning and prioritization and the scheduling such that uh, you, can, you can ensure that the applications that are not satisfying their requirements uh, are prioritized. Of course, you need to do this while providing high system performance. So if you have 1,000 cores that are sharing main memory, it's very easy to satisfy the performance of an application by ensuring that no other application runs in this 1,000 core system. But that gets rid of a lot of the uh, system performance and throughput. Right? Why are you designing a system with 1,000 cores if you're going to run only one core in it? OK, we're going to talk about some things uh, later on. OK, I think that brings me to the end of the lecture 1A. <laughs> the next thing we'll talk about is course logistics. For those of, who's taking this course for credit? It'd be good to know that. Oh, okay. That's a lot of people. Who's taking this course for fun? Okay. <laughs> I see that there is an explicit partitioning between them. So this was, this was not a question that <laughs> to, to partition. You could have an overlap between these two sets, right? <laughs> okay. Who's from industry? I'm curious. Okay, that's a good chunk, actually. Yeah. Okay. So course logistics may or may not be interesting to everyone, but I want to cover them relatively quickly uh, because this is supposed to be a formal course and we, we should not take more than 19 minutes anyway. But whenever I say that, it's, it becomes longer. So I should probably not say that. Oh, this is not it, sorry. I made a mistake. It's actually a single slide, single set of slides. So how, how many people want the lecture slides to be available beforehand? Okay, so, or oh, even, I think that's the biggest set actually. <laughs> okay, so we'll try to make the lecture slides available right before the lecture. Is that good? Or do you prefer it the night before? Oh wow, that's, that may not be as easy, you know. <laughs> that's going to be my, uh, yeah, that's going to be a challenge with the hotel internet. <laughs> Okay, so let's do the course logistics very quickly. Uh, this is actually not a comprehensive, I didn't finish this. Uh, we have, uh, the real thing is in the syllabus, but these are some of the things that I put over here. And some of the things are actually, I'm not sure if we will actually cover like topic six, but th there are some other things that are here like coherence, consistence that I would also like to cover uh, that are not here. Okay, anyway, well, I'll update this and put it on the slide. So this course, I think uh, my goal with this course is to cover many problems and potential solutions related to the design of the memory systems in the many core era or beyond the many core era. Because the design of the memory system poses many difficult research and engineering problems, important fundamental problems in my opinion, and industry relevant problems. Uh, problems whose solutions can revolutionize the world in my opinion. Uh, if you can come up with a very different technology, you can actually make money and at the same time change the status quo, if you will, in the system. I believe many creative and insightful solutions are needed to solve these problems. It's not going to be business as usual. Uh, so my goal with this course is to enable uh, you to acquire the basics to develop such solutions uh, by focusing on both fundamentals and cutting edge research. And we're going to switch between the two. Whenever we talk about cutting edge research, we're going to go back to fundamentals. But I'm gonna build some fundamentals in the main memory system to begin with. So this is my contact information. Uh, you can use my cell phone, WhatsApp, to contact me. That's perfectly fine. I'll be here until uh, next Monday, I think, or early Tuesday. Uh, I'd be happy to meet. I mean, we have some slots in between. 
you can find me during the breaks or email me or WhatsApp me anytime. And there's, this is a website for course slides, papers, and updates. Uh, Roman, who's not here, I guess he's not here right now. He's the TA of the course. Uh, and for the curious, actually, I've uh, given a course in a cases uh, that's a summer school for High Peak very recently. Uh, that, uh, and the slides that I have over, here, over there are linked from there. But we may not follow the same order. And this is us, basically, this Roman. He, he was here earlier. He's going to be back, I think. Okay, I think uh, this is, my in, ge in general, my advice to uh, folks who take my courses. I usually go fast, uh, and I'd suggest being alert during the lectures. Doing the readings is important. I'll provide many references. There will be many, many more references. Uh, and there will be some review assignments also. We have a hot, hot CRP site with the reviews. Uh, I mean, if you need to go back and reinforce fundamentals, but also please ask questions. Uh, there, there, are uh, there are a bunch of pointers that we have uh, in, the, in this over here. And I really like this quote from Louis Pasteur. It says, chance favors a prepared mind, which means that there may be no such thing as chance. There's little amount of chance. You can actually bias the coin in your favor if you're actually prepared uh, enough. I think I'm in Technion. I don't need to say this. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> okay, uh, we'll, we'll do some paper reviews. Uh, so how to do a good paper review. I like talking about this a little bit because I, uh, I think it's important. If, you're, if you do the paper reviews, for example, as part of the exam, it'll be good to follow some structure. Uh, and this is one slide anatomy of a good paper review or a talk or, or, or at least a paper review talk. A good summary would be helpful to begin with. What is the problem the paper is trying to solve? What is its goal? What are the key ideas? What are the key insights? What are the key mechanisms? What is the implementation? And what are the key results and conclusions? Just a very short summary. Uh, but covering these, hitting all of these points uh, is very important, I think. The second is strengths, most important ones. And strengths could be uh, related to the mechanism. Does the paper actually solve the problem well? Is it well written? So there are strengths of the mechanism and strength of the paper. It's good to distinguish uh, between them. Uh, of course, usually strengths you can find in the paper also, but sometimes the authors may not even realize some of the strengths from your perspective. That helps. As a reviewer, it's good to know that. Uh, unfortunately, I have a lot of issues with the current review system, so we're not going to go into that <laughs> in, the, in the scientific community. <laughs> we should fix the scientific community. Maybe we need lectures like this for a scientific community to begin with. Uh, okay, weaknesses, I think, especially for this course on critical thinking, this is really important, uh, focusing on the most important weaknesses. Every paper has a weakness. This doesn't mean that it should be rejected. This doesn't mean that it's wrong or something, but it's good to think critically about those weaknesses. Uh, uh, this doesn't mean that the paper is bad, for example. It means that there is room for improvement and future research actually uh, can accomplish this. So this is where people can think critically to actually develop new ideas. So it's good to focus on that as well. Uh, and then thoughts and ideas, can you do better? It's, it's, I'm always interested in ideas, so if you have ideas, I, I'd be happy to talk about them. Takeaways, what have you learned, enjoyed, disliked? And discussion starters and questions. If you're doing a paper review, like we're not going to do that in this part course. You're not going to give talks uh, and uh, give talks about papers, but uh, that's always good, discussion starters and questions. You could actually have a review that's short and concise. If it's a talk, it's about 20 minutes or less than one page. I don't want to read for pages and pages of paper reviews. And this is, if you're giving a talk, I think this is the suggested uh, discussion format. I, I teach seminar courses sometimes, and this is what I suggest uh, to students in terms of, yeah, you spent 15, 20 minutes in terms of the summary over here, and maybe 10, 15 minutes critique. But you can use this blueprint as a blueprint for doing the reviews for the course uh, or the exam as well. Okay, there's more advice on paper review talk. Uh, I think being very critical is important. I think this is how things improve basically, by being critical and uh, figuring out better ways of solving the problem or related problems. Questioning the problem as well, that's also important. Of course, that's how you learn right in science, uh, by reading background papers. Okay. Uh, okay, we will actually provide a few sample text reviews uh, online. Maybe Roman already put them up, I don't, I'm not sure yet. But I think one thing I, will, uh, I, I would recommend people avoid in general in their reviews, and this I see actually in the review process of conference also, is these rat holes. This actually, does anyone recognize this? This is a not so nice uh, representation of a very famous book. Does anyone recognize this book? 
It's actually one, one of the favorite computer systems performance analysis with Rod Jane. And this is a page or part of a page from that book that I found online from one of his lectures. And basically, he points out 20 different things that uh, people can uh, rat hole you into in a discussion or in a paper review whenever you do some performance analysis. Basically, they can always question the workload. Oh, OK, you evaluated these 2,000 workloads, but it doesn't work for 2,001. And that's a rat hole, basically, at that point, because you didn't evaluate it, right? You can reason about it, but you, know, you never evaluate it. You're not going to get out of that rat hole. So acknowledge it and move on, as opposed to being uh, in that rat hole. Metrics, another one. Oh, you evaluated these 500 metrics, but there's this 500 first metric that I care about. And I see, I see this actually review system being bog, bogged down in rat holes today in conferences. I, I like talking about these rat holes, but this was actually a book that was written in the late 1980s, I think. Uh, okay, configuration or system configuration. You evaluated these 500 configurations, but you didn't evaluate 500 one configurations. So you see what I mean, right? I think it's really uh, good to study these rat holes and be aware of them so that when you're doing reviews, you don't go into the rat holes and you don't push the discussion into the rat holes also. I wish there was a way to control the reviewers so that they don't go into these rat holes also. Okay, but I would definitely recommend this book. If you haven't really uh, studied it, uh, this is a very nice book and find that page with the rat holes with a much better drawing of the rats. <laughs> okay, I also uh, recommend uh, one, of, one of my older colleagues, uh, um, one of my colleagues in my old institution, K1 Fetalian has this nice, uh, PDF that talks about how to give clear talks. I agree with a lot of the advice that is given over here. These are some of the principles that he has written. Every sentence matters. The audience prefers not to think. I agree with this. Uh, basically, give them what you want them to receive. As opposed, don't, them, don't make them think because while you're talking, if they're thinking, there's a problem. They will lose you. Surprise are bad. Uh, yeah, explain every figure, graph, or equation. Yeah, and the audience is always right when improving the talk. Actually, I like this uh, the most, perhaps. Uh, who painted this painting? I'm going to cover the, there's a side channel here that's <laughs> that you should not look at. Any guesses? Now that you've seen the side channel, very famous painter. How about now? No, oh, it says Dolly, you found it. Sorry. <laughs> This is when he was young. <laughs> what about this one? It says Dali, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> about uh, later. I mean, he didn't live for that long. So what's the point of this? Basically, the takeaway is learn the basic principles before you consciously choose to break them. <laughs> Apparently, the young Dali learned the basic principles by painting someone else. It's not him, by the way. And he broke all the principles later on in life, as you can see. OK, I think this is really important for doing the reviews also. Uh, OK, there are a bunch of reading videos and reference materials, as I said. Uh, some of these we're going to cover. Actually, when we talk about processing in memory, uh, this is a recent paper that we've written enabling the adoption. We talk about a lot of adoption challenges of processing in memory. Uh, we can t uh, I'm going to recommend that. This is a relatively old paper that I keep recommending still, since we didn't update it recently. And we're going to cover this also. And uh, we, we'll talk about memory scaling a lot, especially in the next lecture. And this is another paper that we may cover in terms of flash memory scaling. We'll see how the lectures go. We're going to dynamically schedule a bunch of things depending on the topics and interests of people. Uh, and these are some related videos and lecture materials. There are some open source tools. Uh, actually, we'll talk about Jamulator later today, for example. And I'm giving give you some assignments related to that. Uh, and a bunch of more. OK, all reference papers are available. Hopefully, are going to be available over here. But you can also find them on my website. So grading, I'm not a big fan of grading short courses. But there will be a final exam uh, for those of you who take the course. Others are welcome to take the final exam. But you may not enjoy it as much. <laughs> uh, it's going to be two hours. Hopefully, it'll be fun. Uh, and I will also uh, recommend that you do at least three paper reviews, but more than uh, more is recommended. We have the Hot Crap website. That'll prepare you for the exam also, perhaps. And participation is strongly encouraged, of course. Since all of you are here, it would be great if you participate. And that's the end of course logistics. Any questions? Yes?
Not necessarily. But for the first, oh, OK, you don't think, OK, yeah. The, the question is, uh, the lecture slides are online in the course website. Is the order, uh, for, those are the lecture slides from the cases course that I delivered over the summer. Is the order going to be the same? For the first few lectures, the order is going to be somewhat the same, but uh, there's a lot more detail on these slides because that was only a six and a half, half hour course. This is a much longer course. And there will be some things that are not in that course. For example, in that course, we didn't cover flash memory as much. We didn't cover uh, coherence and consistency at all. Uh, so we're going to cover things like that. Uh, yeah. But I, I, it's going to be my intention to actually post the slides the day, the night before the lecture, if not the morning uh, before the lecture. So I'll try, I'll try my best. And these slides, I'm going to try to send them to Roman right away so that the, um, in the afternoon you'll see some of the uh, things that we're going to cover. Okay, any other, qu there was one more question over here. I thought there was another hand. Maybe that was the same question. Any other questions, thoughts? Does this sound good? Was this useful, the paper review thing? Yeah. yeah. Actually, if, if you find it useful, I'm giving a seminar course at ETH this, uh, this semester, and uh, I actually gave example paper review talks because what, what the students do is that, uh, stu there, there will be students who are presenting, I think 25 of them. They're going to do a paper reviews, one for each paper. And basically, I gave them example, three example reviews, two example reviews. If you're interested, you can watch it and see what I think would be a good paper review as a reading group discussion starter. <laughs> that would be useful also. Hopefully, that will not be time spent for nothing. OK, so we have four minutes. I don't think I'm going to cover a lot of the next lecture in four minutes. But I can take questions related to what we have covered so far. Ten minutes more. Oh, OK, yeah, sorry. Yeah, then we're going to start with the next one. Actually, 15 minutes more. OK, so we're going to go to the next one. So we're going to end wherever we end in the middle. So let's start with the basics. Basically, uh, this is what I intend to do to begin with because fundamentals are important. And we're going to look at main memory, but we're going to look at other parts of memory also. And this is memory in a modern system. As I said, most of this is, this is AMD Barcelona, circa 2006 or so. Uh, basically, cores are bigger over here, as you can see, but a lot of them are regular. Memory is inside them also. But most of the system is still dedicated to memory. And whenever we design a system, it's always good to talk about idealism. Uh, I have actually another slide, not here, uh, that talks about idealism in processor, idealism in data supply, idealism in uh, instruction supply. And we want memory to be ideal also. So what does that mean? Ideally, we want zero access time, no latency, infinite capacity, zero cost, and infinite bandwidth. Right. That's great. And zero energy. This is relatively backward looking, so energy is not here. <laughs> uh, of course, this is not easy to achieve. The problem is ideal memory's requirements oppose each other. Bigger is slower, fundamentally. And faster is more expensive, fundamentally. Higher bandwidth is more expensive, again, fundamentally. So bigger take, uh, if, you have, if you have a bigger memory, it takes longer to determine the location because you need to have longer interconnects. If you want a faster technology, you need some expensive technology, like SRAM is fundamentally faster than DRAM, uh, disk versus tape. And it becomes more expensive as you go from right to left over here. Higher bandwidth is also more expensive. You need more banks, more ports, higher frequency, or faster technology, basically. All of these increase your cost. And that's the fundamental problem in memory. We're going to look at some of these technologies. And as a result, we have the memory hierarchy and the proliferation of different memory technologies. So DRAM, we've already covered this. I'm not going to go through this uh, again in detail. Basically, you have this capacitor as the access device, uh, the storage device, and you need to have uh, an access device, access transistor, and row enable and bit line over here. So it's very simple and small. The problem is capacitor leaks through the RC path and DRAM cell loses charge over time and it needs to be refreshed. And we're going to cover a bunch of works related to refresh later when we talk about reliability. Uh, SRAM, static random access memory, is fundamentally bigger. You have these two cross-coupled inverters. You already have four transistors over here. Each inverter is two transistors uh, to store a single bit. And this feedback path enables the store value to take this with a grain of salt, persist while it's powered on in the cell. 
So you have four transistors for storage. And you have two transistors for access. You have this bit line and bit line bar, and then you do differential sensing at the bottom over here. So you have at least six transistors. If you want it to be more reliable, faster, you may want eight transistors also. Uh, so that's the fundamental difference. Phase change memory, we briefly talked about. This is a completely different technology. It has some material, let's say chalcogonite glass, that exists in two, two states in nature. Amorphous states has high electrical resistivity, crystalline state has low electrical resistivity, and you have an access device uh, that detects these two different states, and you have mechanisms to reliably switch between these two different states. And we're going to talk about that when we talk about emerging technology. But this is a fundamentally different technology. There's no charge here. You heat the material to melt uh, this thing be beyond the uh, temperature such that you make it amorphous or crystalline. Okay, and we're going to talk about some work. Some of these are going to be review papers. Uh, we're going to cover this work a lot, for example. And this is going to change the future of main memory, in my opinion, more. So let's talk about some fundamental concept. Regardless of the technology, banking is a very fundamental concept. We're going to talk about it more and more. This is also called interleaving. Basically, the motivation for this is twofold. Uh, one motivation is you need to enable multiple accesses in parallel. And if you have a single monolithic memory structure, you cannot access it well. There are multiple solutions to that problem, but one solution is banking. You chop the monolithic memory structure into multiple pieces and enable parallel access or pipelined access to different pieces. That's the idea of a bank. That's the application level motivation, let's say. And this was developed uh, especially for supercomputers. Cray-1, for example, had banked memory. It had an 11 cycle memory access latency to each bank, and it had 16 banks because they wanted to ensure they could get one word out of each bank every cycle. If you have an 11 cycle access latency, if you have 16 banks, and if your data is mapped nicely, which is a really important part, if your consecutive words are in consecutive banks, and if you're accessing banks in a consecutive manner, you can get one word per cycle every 11 cycles right, from each bank, which means that you can get one word per cycle from the entire memory. So banking enables this multiple access in parallel. But also there is a design perspective as to why banking is important, because if you design a single monolithic memory array, uh, and if you want to increase the capacity of it to be large, it takes too long to access. So fundamentally, as a designer's, hardware designer's perspective, you also want banking. You want to chop this memory into pieces and enable different uh, accesses to it, uh, not necessarily in parallel, but enable separate accesses to it. And this essentially gives you multiple banks. This gives you lower latency because your interconnects are shorter compared to a huge monolithic array. So I like this. Banking is very fundamental because it's driven by both applications as well as the hardware design. Uh, so the goal is to reduce the latency of memory array access and enable multiple access in parallel. And the idea is basically you divide the array into multiple banks, partitions, that can be accessed independently. And independently means if you have actually separate ports to these pieces, you can access them independently in the same cycle. You can enable, for example, if you have 16 banks, you can enable 16 accesses at the same time. Or if you're more limited by the ports, because you may be off chip, then you actually share the ports, address, and command buses between these different banks. But you can start access in one bank in one cycle, in the next bank in the next cycle, in the next bank in the next cycle. That way you can pipeline the access and overlap most of the bank, bank access latencies. It's not as good as accessing, having, having separate ports to the banks, but you have some other requirement that dictates your cost. So in DRAM, because DRAM is off chip and you, you, you actually are very much limited by the number of pins, the banks are not completely independent of each other. The banks actually have dependence because they share the command and address buses, uh, as well as the data bus, actually. As a result, you, you need to access the banks in consecutive cycles. Okay, each bank is smaller than the entire memory storage and access to different banks can be overlapped. So hopefully these are basics. Does everybody know about banks here? Memory banks? Okay, don't be shy. Who doesn't know? Don't be shy. Okay, that's good. Then I'm spending some time. That's good. Okay, an issue is how do you map data to different banks, of course? Uh, how do you interleave data across the banks? Uh, so if, if you have 16 banks uh, and if your consecutive words in memory are in consecutive banks. Word zero is in bank zero, word one is bank one, word two is bank two, dot, dot, dot. 
where 16 is in bank one again, bank zero again. If your processor is accessing addresses such that it's accessing address zero, address 16, address 32, address 48, you have a problem. You have 16 banks, but you're always accessing one bank. Right? Now, whose fault is it? The fault could be your interleaving scheme, because you didn't really map interleave the data nicely. Or the fault is in the processor, right? The processor should not be accessing things like that. <laughs> you can blame the compiler also, yeah. So this is uh, not an easy problem uh, to, to make. Uh, if you take it as hardware's fault, people actually have designed randomizing mechanisms. So when you get an address, you basically pu uh, take it through a hash function. And that hash function determines which bank that address maps to. And that hash function could be randomizing. And we're going to talk about some works, like uh, one of the seminal works in this area is an ISCA 1991 paper by Bob Rao, pseudo-randomly interleaved memory. And he basically talked about matrices that can actually make this hash function more random. But of course, that increases your access uh, latency to memory. But that gets rid of a lot of the bank conflicts. But now, of course, it's much, more, much harder for the software to reason about how to map its data across the different banks, because it needs to take into account this randomizing hash function. Right? So how do you eliminate bank conflicts is important whenever you have banks. And this is going to be an issue at any part of the memory system, because bank conflicts actually delay requests quite a bit. OK, so this is what a bank looks like in hardware. Basically, you have a two-dimensional storage array. Uh, in each XY point, you have a cell, a single bit cell. It could be a SRAM cell, DRAM cell, phase change memory cell. It doesn't matter. All memories actually look like this two-dimensional storage array so that you maximize uh, your uh, area. And uh, as you can see, there's a row decoder over here. Whenever you input, you input the address. It gets lashed into an address register. This is an example. Uh, most significant bits are decoded. They identify your row. And then you access the entire row. You decode the row address, which drives the word lines over here. And the selected row drives the bit lines. This could be, let's say, eight kilobytes. So you read the entire row down to the sense amplifiers. Over here, we'll we're going to talk about DRAM. You amplify it. You figure it out. And then the least significant bits of the address dictate which part of the row that you need. This could be eight kilobytes, but you may be interested in only one cache line, 64 bytes. And the job of the column decoder is to take it out and send it to output. And actually, in a real bank, uh, you actually take about eight bits or so from here, and then you aggregate data coming from many chips, as we will discuss in a little bit, so that you make uh, 64 bits out of the chip. Okay, and then once you're done with the access, you need to precharge the bit lines, uh, which means I prepare the array for the next access. Question? Well, I, I'm looking for a subarray. Subarray? Oh, there's no subarray here. This is bank. Yeah, we're not at that abstraction level yet. Yeah. So he's mentioning. Oh, this is. Uh, so this is the bank abstraction, but this, internally this is actually broken down into smaller pieces. Because this may be 32,000 rows over here. And that 32,000 rows is very long to begin with. If you actually had interconnects going through 32,000 rows, that would be very long latency. So internally this is actually chopped into much smaller pieces that are not visible here. But this is the abstraction level that the memory controller sees. This is the abstraction level that the software should see, although they don't always see it, but they should, aware, they should be aware of the banks, at least. They can be, by reverse engineering the mapping. Uh, we don't go below this abstraction level from the software or the memory controller level today. But we, we will talk about something called subarrays that could actually optimize this design significantly. So actually, uh, it's good to think about memory as this box where you input address and data and command, and then you get data out or data in. Uh, and as you go into the smaller dimensions of it, it, like, it looks like snowflakes. It's like, it's like the same thing, divide it and divide it uh, so, so that you can make it, uh, make it work in a low latency fashion. OK, so the, let's see. Uh, actually, one more thing that I want to discuss over here. Uh, you input the address over here, but if you look at off-chip and on-chip memory, there's a fundamental difference. Wires are no problem in on-chip, right? If you're on the same chip, you can have many, many wires. But if you're off-chip, those are huge off-chip interconnects. So these are very precious. If this is coming from outside the chip, you don't want a huge address to be in to input at the same time. So most DRAM chips are very much pin limited. They have, let's say, eight bits data out. 
the address bits, you don't put both the row address and the column address at the same time. You supply them separately. You send the row address first with the activate command that activates the row. And now you use, let's say, 18 address bits or 16. And then you send the column address next in some other cycle and use the same address pins to be able to do that and the same command pins and then specify a column access. So that's the nature of DRAM on chip versus off chip memory. Okay, so basically why do we want memory hierarchy? Because we want both fast and large, but we cannot achieve both with a single level of memory. As a result, the idea is to have multiple levels of storage, progressively bigger and slower as the levels become farther away from the computation unit. And we want to ensure most of the data the processor needs is kept in the faster levels. And as a result, we have a picture like this. Basically, the fundamental trade-off is fast memory is small and large memory is slow. <laughs> right. You cannot get both. You cannot get uh, big, fast memory. And as a result, you have this memory hierarchy, starting with the register file, caches, main memory, hard disk. And as you go from left to right, latency of memory increases because this becomes bigger. Cost reduces because this becomes a slower technology. Size increases, capacity increases, and bandwidth reduces because the interconnects over here are on chip. Interconnects become much, much more expensive as you go farther. So basics of caching. I'm going to cover caching and then we're going to stop at a natural point uh, since we've gone, come over here and then uh, we'll adjust. Basically, the idea of caching is very simple. To st it's employed in not only in hardware but also software in many places. You store recently accessed data and automatically pass manage fast memory called cache. It's automatically managed in the case of uh, especially hardware caches today. Anticipation is that the data will be accessed again soon. If this doesn't work, caching doesn't work, of course. And many applications today do not necessarily have this property. So there are two principles. Temporal locality principle says recently accessed data will be accessed again in the near future because you are doing something to that data. And this is what Morris Wilkes had in mind in the seminal paper that I'm going to briefly mention uh, that introduced caches, but there are older papers I'm going to talk about also. Basically, he says the user is disgust of a fast core memory of, say, 32,000 words as a slave to a slower core memory of, say, 1 million words in such a way that, in practical case, the effective access time is nearer that of the fast memory than that of the slow memory. It's beautifully said in one sentence, as you can see. Uh, and spatial locality is another dimension of locality. You store addresses adjacent to the recently accessed address uh, such, uh, in automatically managed fast memory. Basically, you logically divide memory into equal size blocks and fetch to cache the access block in its entirety. And the anticipation is that some, some other things in this block will be accessed again soon because, because they're spatially located together, there's some correlation in terms of access also. And nearby data in memory will be accessed in the near future. And this works because programs have the sequential access behavior, array traversals, for example. Or if you have nicely allocated regular allocation patterns, and if you have a linked list that follows that nicely regular allocation, you're basically going sequentially in that linked list most of the time. Uh, or instruction accesses, you're mostly sequential, right? At least with the, uh, with the current ISAs we have that are von Neumann uh, architectures. And sequential processing is the whole mark of, of von Neumann architecture, right? And this is what IBM 36085 implemented. It basically had a 16 kilobyte cache with 64 byte blocks. It's amazing that we still have 64 byte blocks and we're 50 years later. Good to think about these things. Okay, so a note on manual versus automatic management. This is a classic uh, programmer versus microarchitect trade-off. In manual uh, management, programmer manages data movement across the memory hierarchy levels. Uh, this usually too painful for programmers on substantial programs, so compilers can actually also do that, but locality is not very easy. And this is still done in embedded processors. It's also done in GPUs, for example. They have what's unfortunately called shared memory. Essentially, it's an on-chip scratch pad where you manage uh, manually, and it's not easy to manage that, in my opinion. It's essentially a separate address space compared to uh, 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 the main memory. Automatic hardware manages data movement across the levels transparently to the program. I said hardware, but it has to, it can be the system, right? It doesn't have to be the hardware over here, but hardware, of course, accelerated if it's on chip memory. Uh, the big advantage is programmers' life is easier, and there may be many heuristics developed over here. Keep most recently used items in the cache, but there are many, many others that are developed. And the good thing is the average programmer doesn't need to know about it. You don't need to know how big the cache is when you create the program. But if you want to write a fast program, then you need to know how, the, how big the cache is. So you may actually be back to square one if you really care about the performance of your program. And maybe we need different sorts of interfaces 
to, to, to memory to actually get the benefits of both automatic and manual management. There's a lot to cover here, but as you can see, I'm going relatively fast because these are relatively basic concepts. We want to get to the advanced ones. So this is actually a paper that I would recommend. I'm not going to require, but this is only a three-page paper, maybe two and a half, that introduced the idea of caches. As you can see, we've already discussed this. And uh, Morris Wilkes had automatic management in mind also. By the slave memory, I mean one which automatically accumulates it to itself words that come from a slower main memory and keeps them available for subsequent use without it being necessary for the penalty of main memory access to be incurred again. Again, it's beautiful. This is an historical aside. Uh, I actually like looking for the original source of uh, anything, if you will. This is in caches also. There's some debate in terms of what's the original cache paper. Morris Wilkes paper is definitely not the original cache paper in terms of hardware caches. And this is more of a storage cache, which is really interesting. But this one, uh, this one that uh, we found with my students is one of the more interesting ones. This was this from the National Cache Register Company in 1962 and CR. They basically wrote this paper, and this is a picture from that paper, which actually they called the look aside. But this is essentially a cache, associative address. This is a tag store. This is a data store. And this is a data buffer register. And this is analog. They, they call this analog usage indicators, meaning these are whether you've actually touched this data recently. And this is basically a hardware cache that they developed. And this is the o most original paper that I could find, at least in the languages that I know of, which are not that many. OK, I'd recommend this paper, but it's not required for this course also. So a modern memory hierarchy, essentially, while this is the memory hierarchy from maybe 56 years ago now, a modern memory hierarchy looks like this, but it's a little bit more embellished. Basically, we don't have one level of cache, but we have many, many levels of caches. And we have automatic management in most of those levels over here. We have the register file, which could be considered a compiler or manually managed cache for the address space that's down here, main memory. And we have actually DRAM as a cache for the swap disk also over here that's managed by the system uh, with demand paging. So this is the hierarchy that we have today. Uh, okay, maybe what I, what I will say is it's good to think about, okay, this is 56 years ago. This is today. We keep adding all of this complexity. Is it going to end or is it, is it really buying us performance? Okay, uh, this is a really natural place to stop. So this is where we should take a break and we'll start back again at one, I think. <laughs>